All right, look, this stack was meant to be a joke. The only reason I even reached for this in the first place is because I needed something to build an insanely simple and minimal internal application. The stack we ended up going with here was pocket base and spell kit. And honestly, this really surprised me. I did not expect to really like this all that much. Figured it would just be a band-aid, but it's not. I think I will be using this a lot for these types of projects. So this is it. This is the entire stack. It is literally just the entire backend is pocket base. That's the auth, the database, the storage, everything. And then the entire front end is just a client side SPA mode spell kit app. Now, like I noted over here, I made a couple weird choices in this that I wouldn't normally make. And I want to talk about why. So first and foremost, why pocket base? If you watch this channel for a while, you know that I'm a pretty big super base advocate. I really like it. I work with it all the time. It's what my two biggest projects and companies are built with. But the reason I didn't use it here is because I wanted something even simpler and even more lightweight. This is not going to scale to almost anything. And pocket base is literally just a single executable that you can download off their website. And then it has your entire backend in there. Obviously that's not going to scale in the same way that a ton of really powerful features built on top of Postgres will, but for an application that's only going to be used by like 10 guys, it really doesn't matter. And pocket base was just the quickest and easiest to get up and running with. And I also here wanted to use the sort of base products, the super base, firebase, pocket base. I wanted to use it in the way that they often recommend and are kind of built for, which is the client first approach where you can connect to your pocket base or super base or firebase instance via their SDK and do all of your CRUD logic from the client side code. You can do your database in there. You can do your authentication in there. You don't need to have a server for your application. We're doing an entirely client side Svelkit app. And the reason for that is because that way I can just deploy it to static web hosting. I don't have to worry about spinning up a server on Vercel or on SST or, or whatever I ended up using. I can just take that and stick it in S3 or stick it in like a render static file instance or whatever I want to do. It makes it really easy to just host and build my Svelkit app. And then I just communicate with my backend with the client side pocket base SDK. Now, if you've watched my videos in the past, you know that I'm not usually a fan of this pattern. I really don't like this that much, and I still don't for applications that are going to have any form of scale or could have any form of scale. Because the problem here is that in order to secure this, obviously if you're connecting to your database from the client, the client is being deployed onto the user's computer, which means that they have access to everything in the client, which means that you have to make your database publicly accessible. And the only way to secure this is with API rules. You have to go through on all of your collections and set a search rule, set a view rule, set a create rule. And what this means is that as your data model expands and gets more complicated, because none of my real projects like Insider Viz or Block or anything I worked on at work, None of these projects had less than like 10 tables in them. The data model on these things gets complicated in order to do real stuff. So going through and setting up fine grained rules here to actually secure that is a nightmare. If you look at a lot of the security incidents we've been seeing lately, a lot of them are on Firebase projects because it's really, really easy to just forget in some collection or in some weird way to just allow everyone to view everything. It's not that hard to make it so that everyone can view everyone's to do's and suddenly your application just isn't secure. And that's just not something I want to play with. I want my applications to be secured on my own server. Let me handle that. Make sure the authentication authorization is done right. But for these tiny applications that aren't going to be used by very many people and have super simple data models, because for all these projects that I'm building here, and I'll talk about more that I'm doing later, the data model really only has like two or three collections at most is really not much, which makes it super trivial to block everything off with these security rules and not have any leaks. So I went with an entirely JavaScript based approach here, and this started out entirely as a meme. I really just thought like, hey, I started out my web dev journey with the modern T3 stack. From day one of doing web, I've always been doing TypeScript. I've never really done anything with raw JS. In school, I had to do some projects with Ruby and I hated not having types. It felt awful to me. But I see a lot of discourse online about the dynamic versus static typing and I figured, hey, what the hell, let's give it a try. Let's try the dynamic typing. So I went with just a raw JS approach. I guess that's not fully true. I did do, I did cheat a little bit and I did set up the JS doc stuff here. So if you look over here at like my pocket base instance, it does have some of the built in types here and I do still have some types that are just being inherited, but I'm not doing any type checking and I'm not doing any like setting of types or anything like that because it just makes it a lot quicker to work with. I want to be super clear here that I I am not an anti TS guy and don't use this as like ammunition in the TypeScript is bad world. I'm not in that world. 
I found that when working in big projects, it is really nice having TypeScript, especially for the refactoring ability. Being able to go through and just set something in one of my endpoints or set something in my data model to just switch it and change some types, I will instantly get red lines everywhere across my code base where that broke. And it makes it super easy to make a change and then just play find the red lines and fix them and pretty quickly iterate across my app. I actually find my iteration speed with TypeScript is a lot faster than it would be without it because if I did that in this raw JS world, I'd very quickly run into the problem of cannot read type of undefined of undefined. It would suck a lot. So like I said, I wouldn't use this in a big app, but in these smaller applications, it did feel kind of nice to be able to go in here in my um, auth store and not have to set types for like the user here. I could just set it to be null. And then in here, I can just do this dot user equals auth store dot model. It would normally yell at me for this. I'd have to put a generic in here. I'd have to do a bunch of annoying stuff, but it makes it really easy to just quickly throw things where I want them and kind of just make stuff happen. It was really quick to build and iterate on this, and I really enjoyed it. The example I'm looking at here is just a basic to-do app example. I'll have it linked down below if you guys want to check out how I did this. It's, you know, it's exactly what you would expect. Throw some stuff in here and it'll work. You can uh, mark your to-do as completed. You can delete it, do whatever you want to do. And you can see right here that everything is being saved into the pocket-based backend. I also leaned really heavily into the sort of class structure that you can do with Svelte 5 here, where we use runes in .svelte.js files. So you can see in here, I created an auth store, and this auth store has all of my authentication information in it. It's got my sign in with Discord, sign in with GitHub, my logout, and it also stores the current user in here. And what that means is that within my um, actual pages, I can just go in here and I can do const auth equals get auth context, which is a function I'm exporting down here in my auth.svelte.js file. If you've seen some of my previous videos about Svelte 5, I was actually kind of doing this wrong. This video by Hanabite is really good. I'll have it linked down below. And he goes through and explains why you want to make sure that your global stores are wrapped in context so that they, they don't accidentally get server side rendered, which would cause them to be available to multiple users and can leak some weird stuff. So you want to make sure that you're wrapping these in a context, which is what I'm doing here. So all you have to do is initialize a store here. So with this set auth context, which I am calling in my layout.svelte. So whenever we mount this application, we'll go ahead and create our new auth store. And then within my page.svelte here, we're just getting that same auth store. And what's really cool about this is within my auth.svelte.js, we have this constructor here, which contains an effect. So this is basically just an on mount function that whenever we mount the application, we'll go through and check whether or not we have a valid authentication instance. And if we do, we're going to set our user object to be equal to that authentication instance. And then we're going to set this dot synced equals true. And then within our layout.svelte, we can go ahead and only render our, um, children, which is just our application, if we have our auth state loaded. So this whole system is very different from my, how I usually build applications where we're doing everything client side. So I basically went ahead and created these stores for all the different pieces of my application. And I also created this to do.svelte.js. This to do store is almost like the client side routes that I'm creating to interface with my to do's. So whenever we create a new to do store, we're going ahead and fetching all the users to do's. And I'm actually not doing this user wise. I'm literally have this set up so that the to do's are global. The whole idea of this application is that you would host it and then just use it for yourself. You wouldn't make this public. It's just all of the to do's would belong to the one user here. So we can go ahead, fetch all the to do's and then have our methods here to create the to do to toggle the to do to delete it. And then if you look at the logic for this, in our actual markup, all we're doing here is we're just basically doing to do dot delete to do on our delete button. We're doing uh, toggle to do on our switch here. It's just really quick and easy to get this up and running. And that's really the whole point of this. This is a really quick and easy stack to get working in a matter of like an hour. I'm building a suite of like personal tools that I want and all of them are using this stack because it's such an easy stack to work with. Like I said earlier, I wouldn't recommend this for bigger, more complex and serious projects, but for these little kind of side project type things, and especially like personal internal apps, this feels really good. It's really fast and easy to work with. And I think the way I would deploy this would actually be with like a $5 VPS type thing. It really makes a lot of sense to just set up like a $4 instance on DigitalOcean, attach some storage volume to it, point your local pocket-based SQLite instance to that storage volume and then serve your application with that. That's all you need. It is really cool that this works. And the biggest thing that I'm kind of wondering about with this is whether or not this would make sense for prototyping like a SaaS application or something like that. Cause you can build really, really fast with this, but the problem is I'm not sure how well this would scale. And I think, like I said earlier, any complicated data model just doesn't make sense here, but 
for these simple things, it's pretty awesome. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe, and I will talk to you soon.